Shall we try our voices once more on more about Jesus, please? More about Jesus I would know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, more of his love who died for me. I'd like to continue a little further this morning with 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. There is never any place for the glory of mankind in the work of the gospel. The gospel is the work of God, which lays the glory of man in the dust and does for us that which we cannot do. And this is true in justification. It is true in sanctification. And it is true in glorification. Now I'd like to ask you a question. <clears throat> Which is more important? Getting married or staying married? <clears throat> well, you think about that carefully for a moment. <clears throat> now, uh, don't get in a hurry. Think it through. I'm going to take a vote on this. Which is more important, getting married or staying married? Are you ready to vote? How many of you think getting married is more important? How many of you think staying married is more important? What do you have against getting married? <laughs> is there anyone here that thinks it's a dumb question? Why is it a dumb question? Because they're both important. Now, I know there are some young people nowadays who are Isaac and Rebecca in it. And I'm getting so sick and tired of hearing about Isaac and Rebecca, where he just took her into his mother's tent, right? If they're going to Isaac and Rebecca, they better go the whole way. Number one, Isaac was 40 years old. Number two, his father arranged for the partner through a servant. Number three, everybody knew about it. It was a family affair. Number four, he took her into his mother's tent, not the back seat of the car. So if you're going to Isaac and Rebecca, it, well, you better go all the way, and I don't find anyone who's willing to do that. And I still believe, in spite of the fact that you cannot pinpoint exactly what a marriage ceremony is all about in the Bible, that at least it is a public thing, and it is a definite commitment that is known by more than one or two people. Some of us are still old-fashioned enough to believe that marriage is important. Okay, getting married and staying married are both important, and you're actually wasting your time trying to figure out which one is more important. Which is more important, becoming a Christian or remaining a Christian? They're both important. But do you know that today there are theologians and Bible scholars who are getting involved in a big debate? And it goes something like this. Which is more important? 
justification or sanctification. And the devil, who doesn't want people to understand the whole theme of salvation by faith clearly, because he knows that if the people receive it fully and understand it, his power will be broken, is spending overtime trying to get people at each other's throats over this whole question. And it becomes a crying baby to detract attention from Jesus. Um, I referred to the Insight article, The Good News Fight, and I noticed a few heads nodding, but um, I'd like to, I mean nodding in a, a sense, but I would like to uh, present it to you because I think it's a very interesting parable, short one. It deals with justification, having our sins removed, with sanctification, learning to turn away from sin, and with glorification, being taken away from a world of sin. See if you can pick up those three in the parable. Halfway through the nightly recital of the world's hang-ups, Walter Cronkite's benign countenance suddenly disappeared, replaced momentarily by that commercial starring the mud puddle kid. Draped across various items of living room furniture out there in the front of the box were the three watchers. That poor kid's mother really has a problem, number one observed, as up on the screen the kid stomped gleefully through several large mud puddles. She probably had him all ready to go to a party, and now look at him with that yucky mud all over his clothes. Oh, but there's good news, enthused number two excitedly. Just watch now, he added, pointing to the screen, and you'll see that his mom is going to take all those dirty clothes and wash them in mud-begone detergent. That will solve everything. If you've watched this commercial before, then you ought to know that that doesn't solve everything, retorted number one. Just keep watching. They did, and sure enough, the kid sporting freshly laundered clothes charged back outside to the nearest mud puddle. As he splattered himself with muddy goo, his mom shook her head and sighed as she tried to look thankful for her box of mud be gone. There, you see, number one continued. What good does it do for her to clean her kid up if he goes right back out and jumps in the mud? I'll tell you what the real good news is. It's when mom can not only clean the kid up, but also take away his desire to play in mud puddles maybe even make him hate mud. Number three hadn't said anything so far, but he'd been thinking, and now he was ready with his dime's worth. I think both of you may have a point, he began, but even if mom can clean up the kid and then make him hate mud puddles, it seems to me that the problem can never be fully solved until someone takes the mud puddles themselves away. To me, that would really be good news. Well, it pains me to say it, but the three watchers became so upset with one another over what constituted the good news that they stepped out into the street and started throwing mud at one another. <laughs> the last I saw them, they still f hadn't figured out that they had all three seen just a part of the good news, and that it takes all three parts to really solve the kid's problem. But, as Walter Cronkite says, that's the way it is. And so, today the devil is succeeding, with more or less success, to get people involved in a debate over what is the gospel? Is it justification? Is it sanctification? Is it glorification? What is righteousness by faith, technically? according to Paul and the Greek verbs and nouns. Is it justification, sanctification? And the mud begins to fly. And some of the mud flies from Australia, some of the mud flies from Washington, some of the mud flies other places. There is a church in California that is split down the center over this and all the time, 
the good news is all about Jesus. Now, just for the sake of taking a look at our history, honestly, I would like to suggest of these three that Seventh-day Adventists for a long time have been the most interested and have placed the most emphasis upon glorification. Second coming of Christ, after all, that's our name. Second coming, translated to heaven, people raised from the dead, end of the world of sin and pain and trouble and sorrow, uh, change from mortality to immortality. Got to be ready. I hope I can make it. And our, our prayers even have reflected it. You can almost predict the typical cliché prayer. As you come to the close of the prayer, which is already consisted of X number of clichés, you can expect, and now, Lord, when thou comest, grant that we, without the loss of one, might be able to be worthy, to have a glorious, abundant entrance into your kingdom. Uh, you've heard it. And our emphasis is on that, that event, glorification. Help us to all be there. Help us to be ready. I hope I can get ready. I want to remind you this morning, my friend, on the basis of what we already studied this week, that if you have accepted Jesus as your personal friend, you're already ready. And it isn't getting ready, it's staying ready. But that's been our emphasis. And I'm afraid, and I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, that our second emphasis has been on sanctification. This is the way you get ready, by living a holy life, by uh, trying harder and harder to be better and better. You've got to get rid of this, that, and the other thing. Work hard on it. Get ready by sanctification. And our third emphasis, if at all, has been the cross and the atonement and what Jesus has done. Well, we say, yes, that's good. That's nice. We're glad for that. But now we've got to get ready for his coming. Let's work on that. And regardless of where the voices come from, we'll have to admit today that the order should be just reversed. It is Jesus and the cross all the way and what he has already done. And sanctification is the result and the continuation of that emphasis. And glorification goes down in the order of priority. In fact, the mature Christian, like Moses, as a classic example, is willing to even give up his eternal life for the sake of others. Now, I don't want to get involved in saying that one is more important than the other. Because in the end, we'll have to admit that Jesus would be very disappointed if we weren't interested in going to heaven when he comes again. I made a uh, bicycle for my boy one time when he was small. It was a particular kind of bicycle that no one made at the local bicycle stores. It had to have certain kind of handlebars, certain kind of wheels, certain kind of uh, gear shift, certain kind of brakes, certain kind of everything. The only way I could do it was to go to one store here and pick up a frame, another store here and pick up some wheels, another store and get the right kind of paint. And I worked for uh, hours, for days on that thing whenever I had a chance before Christmas until I had the bicycle just exactly what he wanted. And I had it out in the garage. 
And on Christmas morning, when he was out in the garage, went out to the garage to open the door to see what might be there, guess who was hiding behind the boxes in the garage watching? And if that boy had walked in and had looked at that bicycle and said, ah, this crummy bike, I'll tell you something, he would have been in real trouble. <laughs> and if we were, after all, created in God's image, and if God has gone to a great deal of trouble and expense, including blood, to provide beautiful mansions that have been sitting there empty for a long time now. Don't tell me that the builders are just barely getting the last brick up. And if we're not interested in being there, I uh, think there should be, be some real disappointment. I can guarantee that. And so in God's book, Glorification, the end of the world of trouble and sin, and his second coming is very important, and I still believe it. But the cross is the basis of all of it. And what Jesus has already done is the basis of all of it. Now, uh, some of us have gone through some transitions. Twenty years ago or more, I became very interested in this subject because of my own needs. And uh, my primary interest for a majority of that 20 years has been how to live the Christian life. And I called it righteousness by faith. During the last less than five years, there's been a gradual transition in my emphasis and my thinking into the basis of the whole business. And I am uh, much more interested in Jesus and the cross as the basis of how to live the Christian life than I've ever been before. I think that any of you or any of us who have come from different directions in our interest in the things of the gospel are going to come to the realization one of these days that we finally meet at the same point. It may not be until we are in the rocks and the mountains and the caves, because it's probably happening in the quiet lanes instead of in some ecclesiastical assembly. And we may not have a giant Bible conference to settle all of the issues currently in salvation and the gospel. There are some who are even afraid of that. But those who are sincerely seeking God are going to find themselves in consensus of belief one of these days, I believe. And that'll be another part of the good news, that they all may be one. In recent months, I've become interested in what the Bible and spirit of prophecy emphasis is on the balance between justification and sanctification. And I discovered that the balance of emphasis is 50-50. There are some people that want 90-10 one way, 90-10 the other way, but it's 50-50. I bought a new Steps to Christ and went through the book and underlined everything I could find that seemed to refer to justification, the cross, the finished work, and everything I could find that seemed to refer to sanctification, living the Christian life, the Holy Spirit. And it's 50-50. You go to the epistles of Paul and you find that the first half of his epistles are all on justification, the work of Christ, already done. You find the last half of his epistles are on living the Christian life, the result of the first. And that's why this week we spent the first couple of days on justification, and now we shift into sanctification, which is more important, which is more important. They are both important for different reasons, for different reasons. Now, when we read in Ephesians that by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works lest any man should boast. This is talking about the beginning of the Christian life, and it's talking about the continuation of the Christian life. Because in our Adventist history, if we have been in error on our emphasis, glorification, and then sanctification, and barely justification, there has been a second close error, and that is that in sanctification, we have to have faith and relationship with Christ, plus we've got to work hard on it as well. Both of these errors must be dealt with before Jesus can come. And they will be. And I have the good news for you again today that the way we live the Christian life is the same as we became Christians. By faith alone. Colossians 2, 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Romans 1, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 12, he is the author and finisher of our faith. It is Jesus first and last and always. But this becomes very tricky because most of us have had the idea that we've got to uh, get in there and really work hard trying to change our lives trying to be better in order to live the Christian life. There is an interesting quotation in the book, Desire of Ages, page 668. It says this, when we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was so with Christ. If we consent he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Have you ever heard of impulsive obedience? Why, I have experienced a lot of impulsive sinning, haven't you? Can you fathom the idea of impulsive obedience? That's what it says. And then comes the line I began with. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be, not should be, ought to be, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Now, it's obvious here that one is the cause and the other is the result. Four or five years ago, when I had a week of prayer here, our theme was the grapevine. And our premise was this, that a grapevine bears grapes because it is a grapevine, never in order to be one. An apple tree bears apples because it is an apple tree, never in order to be one. A Christian does what is right because he is a Christian, never in order to be one. Do you hear? That is heavy duty. Because most of us have had it just the other way around. A Christian does what is right in order to be a Christian. And we measure ourselves by how we are doing to decide whether or not we are Christians. I'll guarantee you that most of you have known that. Am I right? But a Christian does right because he is a Christian, never in order to be one. And um, 
Our salvation in heaven is never based upon our obedience to the Ten Commandments. Our salvation in he heaven is always based upon what Jesus has already done for us. Then what is the purpose of justification? It is to ensure and to nail down and to make certain our eternal destiny. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're just as saved now as you ever will be. And you can live a life of 40 years or 80 years or 100 years of Sabbath keeping and tithe paying and all the rest of it, and you will not add one iota to your salvation. The thief on the cross was just as saved the moment Jesus said so as he would have ever been. Do you believe that? That has been a hard one for some of us to get our minds around because we have thought that, yes, even though the down payment is free, the monthly payments you've got to really get in and work hard on. Well, then we say, what is the purpose of sanctification? What is the purpose of obedience? What is the purpose of keeping the commandments? Don't miss it. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. The 23rd Psalm, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for what? For his name's sake. Obedience in the Christian life that is wrought out by Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit is for God's glory, not for our salvation. But that is a hard pill for many of us in this subculture to swallow. If you've been hooked on the behavior disease long enough, you have a hard time shaking it. If you think that Christianity is based on behaviorism instead of upon the Lord Jesus and what he's done, then you are in for a long, hard winter because you're going to continue to try harder to save yourself by your own bootstraps. Well, then, where is the effort and where is the work and where is the uh, necessity in living the Christian life? Same as in marriage. I'll tell you a parable. Over 20 years ago, I was in love with this beautiful girl. I uh, just managed to uh, rescue the picture that she gave me when we were 17. <clears throat> from her mother's bureau. I promised to bring it back after I got another one made. She had given me a copy of that, but we broke up, and I tore it up. Don't tear it up. You might get back together again later. Anyway, I was in love with this beautiful girl. And we decided to be married. And uh, so uh, she was living in uh, San Francisco. I was living in Los Angeles. I traveled to San Francisco where the wedding was uh, to take place. And when the preacher asked if I did, I admitted that I did. And he uh, pronounced us husband and wife. After the wedding, she went home with her folks to San Francisco, and I went back to Los Angeles. I told you it's a parable. <laughs> Two years later in Los Angeles, uh, someone said to me, are you married? I said, yes. Um, well, we never have seen your wife. No, she's in San Francisco. Well, uh, uh, do you ever see her? No. How long have you been married? Two years. Do you write to her? No. Telephone? No. And you're married? Yeah. I have a certificate to prove it. And I said, I do. They said, you better go and check on that. <laughs> I 
ridiculous, stupid. If that story was true, you'd run me out of AUC, and you'd find the closest institution to encase me. <laughs> Marriage is based upon something more than saying I do and getting a certificate. And Christianity is based upon something more than saying I do and getting baptized and getting a certificate. There are many people who were married 20 years ago and have done nothing about it since. And there are people who said yes to God 20 years ago, 10 years, 5 years, on the beach or somewhere, and have done nothing about it since. Marriage is based upon communication. And communication is the one single most important word. If you are interested in a young man or a young lady, either you have already communicated or you are interested, desperately interested, in communicating. And you want the chance, and if you have the chance, you will forego anything for the possibility of communication. Am I right? You are happy to skip a class? Nothing else is important, communication. And if people would continue communicating as much after they were married as they did before they were married, we'd have a lot more happy homes. Every marriage breakdown is based upon a breakdown of communication. Don't forget that uh, nearly everyone when they're married are absolutely sure that they're desperately in love. Isn't this true? But what does the case history and the water under the bridge show us? Now, the marriage counselors and the books and all the rest have come up with about six major areas. I've added two to the six, making it eight. Points upon which communication break down in marriage. And I have a little uh, memory crutch that I use. Mr. X and his two R's. Mr. M money, R, religion, I, in-laws, C, lack of things in common, C, children, S, sex, R, reconciliation, R, roles. You'll find if you analyze it that communication breaks down on one of these six or eight levels. And when a young couple comes into my office and they say, we'd like to talk about our marriage, we're in trouble, we go down through Mr. X and his two R's. And we say, uh, how are you on this? Is this the problem? Is this the main problem? And when you go down through all eight and they say, oh yeah, yo, that's a disaster. Oh, we've got problems there. Oh yeah, sure. And you come to the end and you say, boy, they're in real trouble. But as you go down through Mr. X and his two R's and you... Um, find out that there is one problem there that has been eating on their marriage and they begin to talk about what to do with that problem, you can see real hope in saving the marriage, right? But every one of them is based upon the problem of breakdown of communication. And please, it works the same in the Christian life. Christianity is based first of all, upon what Jesus has already done, but it requires your acceptance of it. And that's the point at which justification takes place and conversion, the miracle of the new birth. But it also requires continual communication because Christianity is based upon a relationship with the one who has done it. And that's why John 17, 3 becomes extremely important. This is what life eternal is all based upon, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And that's why the personal, daily, devotional life of the individual Christian is absolutely the basis of the entire thing in the continuing Christian life. And that's the reason why, if you have never had or seen the importance of a personal, daily, devotional life with God, 
then you haven't seen yet what Christianity is all about. Now, when I was a kid, I used to think, and I hate to admit how long into my life I used to think that the devotional life was optional. I used to think that it was reserved for the mystics, that the people who were kind of bent that way, who could get into it, like to pray and read their Bibles, that was nice. And maybe for the people with arthritis and rheumatism who are cramming for their finals. <laughs> maybe this would be nice for them. I thought that the way to be a Christian was to try hard to be good. And if you had any time or energy left over, spend a little time reading your Bible and praying. That's nice. That's a nice thing to do. God will look down and he'll say, look at that. Hey, spend a little time reading. Isn't that nice? I did not realize for a long time that your continuing relationship based upon the elements of communication, talking to him, listening to him talk to us, is the entire basis of the Christian life. Because sanctification is simply continuing to accept his justifying grace on a daily basis. And continuing to accept of his justifying grace on a daily basis is what the devotional life is all about. And if we don't spend time with God, we soon forget. And the value of the atonement and the cross and the gospel begins to fade from our minds, as does the personal fellowship with him. And the acquaintance wanes, and we have nothing left but husks and instead of kernels. So I can predict without even asking you that those of you who have found out what it means to have a realistic, valid, meaningful, private life with God are the ones who are excited about the gospel. And those of you who haven't or who have and no longer do are finding the gospel and religion a drag. I can tell you that without even asking you. Now, my father used to come along when I was a kid, and he'd say, Son, why don't you, you know, spend a little time with God? And he would tell me these things, but I never got it. I used to love to read an illiterate cowboy by the name of Will James. He couldn't even spell, but he wrote fascinating books about the life on the prairies. And I used to dream about being a cowboy with Will James, you know, rounding up the Mustangs. All true stories. I had so many books by Will James I checked out from the local library that my dad became worried and one day he came in and he said, Son, he said, I wish you'd read something uh, a little more worthwhile. He said, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you a book. Early writings. I mean, I got to compare early writings with Will James. And for every book like this that you read that is a good book, I'll, I'll give you another book free. You can build up your own library. Fine, okay, Dad. And I had a library of two books for years. <laughs> Early writings and messages to young people. Never did make it through that one. And then one time he came along and he said, Look, son, uh, uh, please, would you do me a favor? For every uh, two pages you read in something like Will James, he said, would you read one page in something good like this? Okay, Dad, okay. And one day I sat down and I read a hundred pages in the Messages to Young People so I could finish Strawberry Roan. <laughs> For some reason I never got the message. You don't read the Bible, you don't read Desire of Ages for the sake of reading a book. The greatest privilege that God has given is to provide methods, methodologies, by which we can actually come into communion with him. 
You don't read Desire of Ages or the Gospels for the sake of getting some information. You read it for the sake of communication. And it doesn't always come easy. Any more than talking to my wife always comes easy. Oh, you say, don't you love her? Yes. Then you should always love to... No. You know better than that. I come home from the office where I've been talking with people and their problems all day. Right? I have supper. After supper, we sit down. My wife says, tell me what happened today. Everything. That is the last thing in the world I want to do. I want to lean my head back on the sofa and go into some kind of coma. <laughs> but if I don't communicate with my wife, even though it takes some effort at times, I know that good and well, sooner or later, my marriage is going to crumble, right? Because a marriage is based upon a relationship, and a relationship is based upon communication. And you won't always find it easy to read the life of Jesus. And there will be times when you wake up in the morning as a Christian when you won't always find it like duck soup to kneel down and pray. But your continuing relationship is based on it. Does this make sense or not? The little lady, Ellen White, she says, there are times when you don't feel like praying. Those are the very times you need to pray. Are you going to lose out on the blessing of fellowship with heaven just because you don't feel like it? I like an illustration from Tom Davis's book, How to Live the Victorious Christian Life. He says a man is lost in a snowstorm. Snowstorm. Oh, what a beautiful place to use this story. <laughs> Can't do this in California. Lost in the mudslides. And so he's lost in the snowstorm. And he's plowing his way through the snow, and all of a sudden he gets this um, tremendous sleepy feeling that sweeps over him. And he has this uh, temptation to just kind of lie back in the soft snow and go to sleep. But he's heard about that. And he keeps plowing ahead. He denies his feelings. And he keeps plowing ahead, nonetheless, right? Now you change the scene, and you see a Christian who has accepted Jesus, but he, all of a sudden, one day, he feels like sleeping in, forget about the reading of the Bible and the prayer, forget about the continual relationship with God, just kind of lean back and go to sleep. But he's heard about that, and I'm telling you about it. And he denies his feelings and goes ahead anyway. Now once in a while, when we get into this question of obedience, that obedience is really natural in the genuine Christian relationship. People will come along and charge us with being quietists. The name quietist comes from a uh, subdivision of the Quakers years ago who believed in not doing anything unless you felt like it. You don't even read your Bible or pray unless you feel like it. And some of us get charged with that, and I want to deny the charge publicly. I believe it will take every ounce of willpower and effort and energy at times for you to continue communication and relationship with Jesus. And that's why the Apostle Paul calls it the fight of faith. But I am a quietist toward fighting sin and the devil. God has never told us that we are supposed to fight sin and the devil. He has invited us to engage in the fight of faith, which is nothing more than the effort day by day to continue fellowship and relationship with Jesus. Do you catch the difference between the two? The fight of sin? No. The fight of faith? Yes. 
but the Apostle Paul calls it a good fight. And I'm inviting you this morning to one of the greatest bits of news in the gospel. And that is to put your effort and your energy that you may have been wasting toward trying to be good into an entirely different fight, the effort to know Jesus as your personal friend on a daily basis. That's all. I'm inviting you to spend that thoughtful hour or half hour or even 15 minutes, if that's all to begin with, taking the Gospels and the Desire of Ages and beginning to read the story of Jesus for one purpose, for communion with him. And the little lady says, if you will fight this fight with all your willpower, which leaves no willpower for anything else, if you will fight this fight with all your willpower, you will conquer. And an entire change may be made in your life. Does that sound like good news? And what it is, it's simply the continuation of how it started. On a daily basis, accepting his grace accepting his power, accepting his presence, accepting the cross, accepting his forgiveness, right on through. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you want to become acquainted with us. We don't understand it. If we'd been in charge, it seems like we would have let this whole world rot a long time ago. And so today we pray that you'll accept our gratitude for the privilege of becoming acquainted with you and knowing the peace that comes. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. And we thank you for accepting us once more today, just as we are. In Jesus' name, amen.